and today we're going to talk about how we can prepare translation assignments for the language class, particularly keeping in mind that many of you probably have been heritage learners in your classes. Um, so how many of you like to use translation activities in language learning? And how many of you are told that is a bad thing to do? How many of you are told don't do it? Right? Why did they tell you not to do it? <laughs> What's wrong with translating in a language class? You're not ready for that, right? Yeah. And in English, we don't always use the same tenses. It doesn't line up in Spanish. We love progressive tenses in English. We don't love them in Spanish. Many things like that. What else? You're missing the context, right? We're, we don't want to do that literal translation. So right now, I'm going to have you go to Paravaria. I also use Mentimeter. I thought I was being unique and creative. Entonces, um, but I don't have the QR code, so maybe that makes me different. <laughs> maybe that's how, maybe that's how, let's see. So, hang on. Am I on present? Yes. Oh, but you can't see. My screen is showing this. Huh. Huh. Well, let's see. Maybe there is another screen that would show something else. Uh, where did Natalie go? Because she, she's really the only one that can make this happen. And it says, look, my screen is showing this. You know, and nothing changed up here. I you know not. Yeah. But here it's showing, right? What am I missing? I have no idea. Go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. And advance one slide. Does it change here? It does. does. Change? It does. Okay. Can you get out of, um, let's do in show. That's what I was looking for. Okay. And now, now you can see. All right. There you go. Bueno, chicos. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Muy bien. So let's go to menti.com and go to that code. Yo no tengo QR code, but you know. So go to menti.com and then those numbers. Um, yeah. If you don't want to be, you know, famous, you don't have to use your real name. You can just put in a name. You may not even have to put in a name. Yeah. This is the, yeah. And I'll go ahead and get started. And as, as more of you um, get to menti.com, you can either do it on a cell phone or a computer. Um, you can add to the conversation. So let's just work on a scale first. First, maybe one about yourself and then one about your heritage learner student. Maybe you could say whether you strongly disagree or strongly agree or somewhere in the middle, find that you are a competent translator. And then whether or not your heritage learner students see themselves as translators. Yeah. So look at that. We mostly feel like we are, we are translators and our students somewhat see themselves as translators too. Why do you think our students, many of them have not taken an official translation class. Why do they see themselves as translators? <laughs> because they have to do it all the time. I agree. They do it for their parents. Yeah. Okay. See, the numbers keep moving. There we go. Okay. What about this one? To translate something well, you just need to know both languages. I know what you were saying. Just need to know the words. 
<laughs> totally disagree. What about I know how to develop a learning activity? They should have translated. Okay. I guess it could have said translation. Okay. So I will tell you my my biggest. It's well, it's really an interpreting fail. It wasn't a translation fail, but um, I used to work in college uh, teaching English classes at a church. And so every now and then they would say, oh, well, Emily's the bilingual kid. And so let's just have her interpret for us, right? And I didn't grow up in a church, but I was like, I know lots of words, so I can totally do this. And um, well, the guy kept talking about La Santa Cena, La Santa Cena, La Santa Cena. And I was going in my head, I was like, I'm such a good translator because I'm not gonna call it the holy dinner. I'm gonna call it the Holy Supper because I was like, I know it's not the Holy Dinner because dinner sounds like bleh and supper sounds like fancy. So the whole time I thought I was just hot stuff talking about the Holy Supper, I felt pretty great. And then at the end, the guy said, yeah, you're a pretty good interpreter, but did you mean to say communion? And I just kind of wanted to like melt into the floor because I thought that I was making all these decisions. I knew it wasn't dinner, it had to be supper. That sounded better. But even still, just so I knew the words, I hadn't grown up in a church atmosphere. I didn't know those words uh, in context, even though I knew what they meant at a superficial level. And eh, my, my interpreting experiences uh, failed in that sense. Okay, well, and you kind of have some ideas about how to develop a learning activity. Uh, that's what we're gonna look at today. We'll explore a few more impressions first. Um, what's something that you like about translating? It stresses me out sometimes, but uh, it's also really enjoyable. Maybe you can add a phrase of something. I'll wait until I get three or four. Okay. The creative part. Oh, it is creative. I'll show you some very creative translations today that my students have done. Just share something that you know. Working at your own pace, making a text accessible. We're going to talk a lot about social justice and language access today uh, by capacitating our students. It's funny to see different senses of humor. So yeah, have you ever had to try to translate a joke that never goes well? <laughs> Removes barriers and postpones in the Feeling useful. Yeah, things are open to interpretation. Deep reflection on language use. Yeah, because you have to make a lot of decisions at a micro level, uh, many decisions at the same time, learning new words. It's useful. I'm gonna scroll down because many of you had lots of ideas. So translation definitely doesn't suck. It is something that's enjoyable to us. And I think our students find that too. Okay, so why is it so hard? We know that it's fun. What makes it difficult? Like me saying the Holy Supper instead of communion for probably about 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yep, it's something else. It's a body part. Yeah, yeah. Or, or ahorita. Ahorita te ayudo. Well, when am I coming? If, if it's different cultures. Yeah, so let's see. It's difficult because it requires training. People think differently, lack of knowledge. So many different cultural literacies. And it wasn't just that I was unfamiliar with U.S. culture when I couldn't say communion. It was that I thought I was familiar with culture, but I wasn't that familiar with church culture in English. So I was still missing a subculture that didn't, that kind of kept me from translating well. Okay, so what is something that accomplished translators do well? I won't dwell on this one, but we'll see if a couple of you have ideas about what accomplished translators do well. Um, maybe you haven't done much translating, so you're not sure. Yeah. 
but they really have to take in both cultures, right? They have to take in both contexts. Anything else? Accuracy, not change meanings. Get any meanings for us. Tones, they know how to compare. They have training, unlike some of us. Now, I will, you don't have to answer this thing on the document, but if you have some ideas, that would be interesting. Um, translation has kind of fallen out of favor for a while in pedagogical practices, and I think that it is making a comeback. We start to see lots of certificates in translation at universities, um, undergrad and graduate level. They're all over the place now. Um, why are people so interested in translation and becoming certified? There is a global reason. And our students want jobs. <laughs> uh, our students uh, want to major in something that they know will connect to their real world and will make them some money. In Google Translate, it will never be will never be enough. You're right. Our community is needed, and I think that our students are more focused on inclusion and diversity for sure. And yes, mistakes have costly consequences. That's one of our big lessons in class is some of the translations that have gone wrong in the past um, and have caused illness and in some cases death. Whoops, hang on, try to go back there. And what do you think heritage learners might have in terms of advantages in a translation class? What would they already know how to do well? They know both cultures, They're, they get the jokes sometimes, right? They, they're in on the joke, they get the register differences. When I say something like, les quiero decir, versus me complacen informarles, they already perceive the differences in informality, even if they've never heard those words before, they pick up on that kind of subtlety. Yeah. They have that bicultural confidence. Yeah. Our students, let's see, what else do you say? They know, they know more. They have knowledge of the cultures and they can relate to their own knowledge. And they've, they've been in these situations before where they've had to be language brokers or language mediators in those situations. Okay, so maybe you had not used Mentimeter before today and now you've used it three times. I'm sure you are Mentimetered out <laughs> at this point. Let's go back to the card. Okay. And we're seeing the PowerPoint. All right. There's a lot of screens up here. <laughs> Let's see. If I click, that didn't change anything. Oh, now we're good. Okay. So I'm not going to really talk about the history of translation and education. I just kind of put this up there so that you could see that ever since we have been teaching languages, we have been using translation as a pedagogical strategy. Sometimes we view it as very favorable. Sometimes, like some of you say, we were taught not to use translation in the class. Um, but throughout history, I would say that the recurring theme with how we view translation in a language class tends to be where we view that there is a text in language A, and we have to get it into language B, and language B should have no rascals of language A in it because it should be totally separate, right? We do that like my students call it the floor is lava game with their translations, right? Because there is this side and then there's this side and the brecha in between should not have any evidence on the result that we give in text B. Um, unfortunately, that's really not how our brains work. Those of us that live our lives bilingually. Um, so if you were one of those people at the beginning of class or at the beginning of this workshop that said, yeah, they taught me not to ever use translation and language instruction because you're missing out on all of the context and all of the social cues, it's not real language. I would like for you to maybe think about translation in a different way today. That sometimes translations do have rascals of the previous language in them. 
And sometimes our texts are lived bilingually and are better when they are bilingual. And sometimes translations give us windows into both cultures at the same time and allow us to experience two languages in a classroom and two cultures at the same time. And some of you also mentioned social justice in the Mentimeter. Um, I also would like you to think about translation as a way that we can help our students connect to social justice aspects of their skills that they already have, right? Because they can use their translation skills to benefit their community. Okay. So what are some ways that our heritage learner students already use translation or translation type skills in their daily lives? For their parents, yeah. They, they often have to translate for their parents to the doctor. What else? Parent-teacher conferences, translating to, oh, mom, helping other students. What else? The grocery store. What else? Did you ever have to translate for your parents? Immigration forms. Talk about high stakes. <laughs> yeah. So heritage learner students already have a good idea of what it's like to be a translator or interpreter. They've already done it in their daily lives. Um, they've done it where the stakes have been high sometimes, like in the doctor's office and filling out forms and telling their parents how they did in class. Not sure uh, how they're going to navigate that one if it didn't go well. But our, our, our heritage learners are already very experienced with some of the aspects of translation in their daily life. So I'm going to show you today how when I teach a translation class, or also when I teach a grammar class, uh, how I incorporate translation to teach different aspects of the language. So a lot of times when I teach grammar, when I teach vocabulary, when I teach syntax, when I teach pragmatic, and when I talk about language rights and language equity, a lot of those kinds of skills, I build in through translation activities during the semester. So, um, this is when I said that I wanted you guys to open up the slides. I think this is slide six. If you could all go with me to the Jamboard. I don't know, have you guys used Jamboards before? Okay, I guess it's like a typical pandemic thing now, right? When we taught online, we all had these Jamboards. Oh, but you can't see. I can see it up here. Okay, dang it, I have to, all right. We gotta do this in show, sorry. Didn't count on that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> clearly, we don't all teach at the same level, so we're not going to be teaching the same grammar, vocabulary, syntax, and pragmatic con concepts in class. But if you can put a sticky note or two of maybe some topics, ah, reflective work, that's so good. And maybe some different topics. One of the ones I do a lot with translation is uh, transition words. Um, there's always a lot of translation words and text that students don't usually use in oral communication. Um, what this one means with syntax, this was just a fancy way of saying that um, in Spanish, we don't always go subject verb, subject verb, subject verb, like we have to in English. A lot of sentences with verbs that have to do with things arriving or appearing, the subject naturally falls better after the verb, and our students aren't always aware of that. And so I teach that through translation. Things like, llegó la profesora, vino la policía, etc. So I, I'm, that's what I do. That's what I do. I'm teaching, just teaching verbs, any kind of verb. Teaching reflexive forms. What are some other vocabulary? Advice and request. What's another? And maybe some of you, any of you teach dual language and have to teach content areas like science. Okay, you could think about some specific vocabulary domains um, within a science class or a social studies class. What subjects do you have in Spanish? That would be, translations would definitely have some. Vocabulario de la universidad. The subject, the materials. La matricula, you could do that with translation. 
word order. Maybe somebody could put something up here about um, questions. Questions have different word orders in Spanish that we don't always use in English. Depends on the subject, but uh, sometimes my students also want to know how to swear lightly. And I, well, in college, we're allowed to do that. We can, we can do that. Teaching vosotros. <laughs> Very good. So there's lots of different types of activities that we could do um, in class by incorporating some translation work. Okay, um, I know that many of you were probably taught that translations are very discreet and boring and erase context of real life communication, but real life people like our students are already translators, so we might as well get them practice doing that. Um, okay, compound and complex sentences. Ooh. Their syntax. Okay, so on the PowerPoint slide, it tells you why don't you take like one minute <laughs> and look at one sticky note and with the person or the two people next to you, why don't you think of a text type that might have that structure in it that you could use for translation? One sticky note and where you might, what kind of text you might use that would have a lot of that recurring structure, vocabulary, or concept. You've got a minute to do that. Do we have something? Okay, so I'll share with you some of the kinds of translation projects that my students have done, and I'll go through the process of how I kind of look at a text and pull out things that I think students are gonna need to know before they work on the translation. And then I'll give you some time to work on a synthesized version of an activity. So. Um, one of the things that my students did once was translate legal briefs for Equality Texas. It's a um, organization here based out of Austin that fights for transgender rights. Um, and so they gave me their legal briefs. This was what they gave me, obviously. They gave me quite a lot and we divided it up and we worked on it. Before I gave them the text, I read it through and I picked out some of the pitfalls that I thought we would be hitting. Obviously one of them was gendered language. Um, so when I look at this, how would you translate? Most Texans believe that. How would you do it? Just if you were. La mayoría de los tejanos creen que bla, bla, bla. Which, that's how I do it too. And that's how they did it too. And then I said, but let's try to take out los tejanos this time. And of course they said, well, we could put an X or we could put an arroa. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, you can. But let's try to do something else. Like, let's say, la mayoría de la gente tejana cree que. Right, so I was trying to take out any reference to gender language. If you care, that's called using uh, epistemic nouns, where you have a noun like personas or gente, instead of a noun that would correspond to a social gender as well. Um, another thing that I picked out, I saw a lot of ing words in this text, and whenever you see a lot of ing words in text, it's a great opportunity to teach students about infinitives and gerunds um, because. When they get in that like rhythm of just translating literally, they want to say what here. They love siendo, they love ing's because in English, no fácil. We love ing's in English, and they want to apply it to Spanish. So we talk about that. Another thing, whenever I see lots of different uh, conjunctions, it's a good opportunity. They they love porque de. I don't know where they get it from, but they love porque de. So we talk about. Well, can you start a sentence with porque? What do you do? How goes there? How do we use como versus porque versus por? And yeah, um, that's a whole lesson out of there. So anyways, I usually pick out a couple of grammar topics, a couple of vocab topics, prepare some mini lessons, and then we start working on the translation. Uh, let me show you another example of like a thought process. Um, <clears throat> so there's a school here in Austin where most of the students speak Spanish, most of their parents speak Spanish, and their code of conduct was only in English. And so, yeah, we talked to the school. Um, that was also the year that there were lots of uh, rumors about ICE raids. And in a class of 20, one day, five showed up. So it was very important that semester for the students. They really felt the pressure of like high stakes getting it right. They really wanted their translation to be a quality. So um, 
when I read through the manual and divided it up, I said, okay, manual language sounds very impersonal. How are we going to do that? So I said, well, this is a great opportunity for us to learn how to do impersonal sentences with say. They are not very good at that, but they're not very good at it because in daily life, you don't use impersonal sentences, right? It's, it's harder for them. I feel, and it's something where English and Spanish are quite different. So yeah, they are, their first impression was not to use any says, and we worked on that. They wanted a lot of like passive voice kind of things that I didn't love. Um, I also noticed that there was going to be a lot of future, so that was a good opportunity to talk about when should we use van a recibir versus recibirán. They have two different options. What do they mean? Uh, they're kind of the same, not totally at the pragmatic level, so we talked about that. Um, and another one that's very difficult for them is applying um, formal or informal pronoun usage consistently. Uh, they love to mix Tú and usted, especially in commands. I'm not sure why in commands it's like a fuzzy area for them. So we talked about how to select one and how to be consistent. And then we simply had a lesson on how to use word reference and determine whether it was the formal or the informal command um, just off of word reference to make sure that we had like a, a check for ourselves. Um, so this was obviously the version that they came up with. Um, okay. Oh, another fun one in here in Texas, we have Mexicarte Museum, um, and uh, they every year do a very nice Day of the Dead exhibit, and they have a, a program where they bring elementary schools, and they have this big study guide, and they didn't have their activity guide for the bilingual teachers, they were giving them the activity guide in English and said, well, we can help you guys with that. So we translated their activity guide. And one of you mentioned that it's fun to tap into the creative process and translating. This was one of the things where we really got to be creative because well, it was a crossword. So it wasn't exactly the same. Um, you're welcome to click on the link and see the full activity guide. Um, I just gave you an example of something that they translated for it. Um, I wanted to show you one of the big things that we worked on was um, capitalization because they, what do they want to do here? They definitely want Aztec and Maya to be capital because that's what it is in English. And so we worked on capitalization the whole time. Um, and then I mostly give them text to do from English into Spanish. But this project really had to do with social justice, so we took it on anyway. Even though it was from Spanish into English, um, we were contacted by a pro bono lawyer who was doing a case that she can't really tell us about, um, but we assume that it was an asylum case for a trans person uh, that was trying to um, gain asylum here in Austin. And they were preparing the case of this person, and so they had lots of articles in Spanish and we had to translate them into English. I normally don't do that route, but it was really connected to social justice. And there were so many different things that had pedagogical value in there. The biggest one I noticed was um, when we had proper nouns of organizations, we talked about how do we decide if we're gonna leave it the same or if we're gonna change it? Should we like translate asociación de? to association of, or should we just put association at the end, or should we leave the abbreviation, what do we do? And so we explored options about that. Um, and yeah, their, their translations were used in a legal case. Um, yeah. I also did a lot of like phrasal verbs and like how to search in Google, if you put it together just in quotes to figure out what's going on and get it in context, another example. Um, and then I think I just listed a couple more that uh, we've done in the past. I normally, in it depends on how many students I have and how strong they are, but I usually pick two or three big ones per, per semester and then two or three small ones per semester. Um, so why don't you think about wherever you live, probably most of you are here in Texas, but not all of you. Think about your own community and what tech language minorities in your community don't have access to and what they might need access to. It could be really local. It could be something at your school. Um, 
It could be something in your community. It could be like some kind of clinic. It could be, I don't know, posters that you've seen at the grocery store. Um, think about something uh, because we'll work with that in a little bit. Okay. And before I send you off to do <clears throat> your work preparing an activity, um, this happens a couple of times while we're uh, working on our translations. Um, I prepare reflection assignments. I'm kind of like that, that really like down to business strict professor in some ways. I know it doesn't seem, but I really kind of am. And I used to hate reflection assignments because I thought that it was like a filler project and like it was just like gonna pad their grade and I don't care what you liked and what you didn't like, you learned it. Um, but I have really changed my perspective on reflection assignments in the past three or four years, I would say. Um, I now give reflection assignments after we do our first round of translation. So after we've had the mini lessons on the grammar and the vocabulary and we've started working on it, I give them reflection assignments that ask them to identify specific strategies that they used when they approach their translation. And then after they read through it and find things that feel off, specific strategies that they're going to use to fix it. And I'll show you some questions. Um, but also apart from just giving them direction on how to monitor their learning and how to think through the revision, the reflection assignments also give us space to really think about social justice in the language classroom and why we have such an asset that we can use for our community. So let me show you a reflection assignment. Here we go. Is it big enough? Yeah. Okay. So, what we need to do? I don't know what we need to do. I think this might have been one for a doctor's office. Okay. But I asked them, you know, some questions about social justice. Why does this document deserve a translation? Why do we need a translation? What is this about social justice? It's going on here. Um, I asked them. Sometimes some easy questions like what was difficult about this and they have to give me something specific. This happened to be agregar o quitar información that was actually a specific strategy that we were working on in that chapter called estrategias de omisión y adición. So I asked them to revisit that strategy. Um, domesticación y foranización was another strategy that was specific to that chapter. So I asked them to pick from those. And then I asked them, this is like, the meat question. I asked them like what theory or what grammar topic did you apply and what chapter was it in? Show me that one, right? And they go back to that. And then they have a kind of a more concrete way of monitoring their okay. So um I'm gonna give you guys some time to work on a translation activity. Um in a perfect world you would be able to upload yours back to the yeah, to the uh, Google file, but it's not a perfect world classroom. So what we're gonna do is this, you can see that file um, in my folder, but I'm gonna give you a paper copy. Yes, I had someone come to the rescue and bring a paper copy. Um, I would say work in pairs. I think if you, ha I think if you do it in pairs, um, nothing bad will happen if you work in groups bigger than that. But I would say work in pairs or more or less. I will give you um, a copy to break and let's see, maybe just take one per pair, okay? That's what, or one per group of three, yeah. Um, so I know that sometimes when you're put on the spot, you're like, ah, I'm not quite ready to like pick my own text. I have some sample texts up here that you're welcome to use. Um, to think about for translation activities, but I would say first, try to think of a text that maybe you have at Alicante on your computer, something that you think it already exists in your community but should be translated and isn't. If you run out of ideas, I've got, let's see, if you wanted something easy, I've got a poster here about COVID safety rules. Yeah, and those are on there too. But I, if I'm going to work with a text and I have the option of a paper copy, I always have one. Um, I have a, an intake script uh, for an asylum case. 
uh, I have something about climate change because we talked about colonialism in Puerto Rico. Uh, yeah, you can just take one. So if you can think of your own text, use your own if you want one of these. Uh, let's see, I have, what is this? I have a narration that I've separated into sentences. If you'd like to do a narration. Yeah, you can do one of these. Or I have um, a poster about therapy services for a child clinic. Whatever you want. No, I can't see the time anymore now that Como vamos de tiempo? Because I can't see the time now. Until four. Yeah. So why don't you take about 15, 20 minutes and I'll come around and offer some ideas if you get stuck on one of those areas. Fill out your sheet on paper and then later I can scan them. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and write it down. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys can browse, you can shop for a text if you would like a text. Do you guys have a text? Do you guys have a text? Did you come up with something? You have perfect. Okay. Do you have a text to use? You got something? I have samples and I have paper copies of those if you want one of those. Ah, if you have paper copies. Yeah. They're all over there. Feel free to go shopping for a text over there. Yeah. Do you guys have a text to work with? We do. We're trying, trying to find one. Okay, so let me give you some grammar topics that you think these texts that you've found would work for. You can just throw out a couple of grammar topics. Sure, give me some ideas of some grammar topics that you found that would be good mini lessons to do before preparing students to do these translations. What are some grammar ones? Uh huh. Commands. Signs are really a great way to work on commands because for some reason our students love to mix formal and informal. Yeah, it's, what, what else? Articles, when to put it, <laughs> when to put it. Yeah, I get a lot of like, you know, like people always say, yeah. So articles, when to add them, when they're necessary. What else, other grammar topics? Oh, questions, questions. The order of words in a question. Yeah. Past tense. But do you have the narrative one? Yeah. The narrative one is great for past tense. Okay, so after grammar, what did you guys have next? It was after grammar, phrase, okay, or vocabulary concept, sorry. I would say that that might be a frase idiomatica, acá. Sí, that would be an idiomatic phrase. Difficult feelings, oh, difficult feelings. You don't have sentimental feelings. No, no, no. Yeah, that would definitely be under these like idiomatic phrases que tendrías que sí, prepararles a tomar una decisión. Because then you have to say, well, what's more important? Like, you know, yeah, what are, what are we looking at here? You know, like, what do we know about difficult feelings? Difficult feelings. They're definitely not. What did you come up with? Problematicos. <laughs> they might even say like express distressed or something. I don't know, because it's. <laughs> sí, sí. Expresar sus problemas or something. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's not difficult feelings for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Because I'll give you a few more minutes and then we'll share some things. 
Okay, you guys shared a lot of uh, grammar topics with me already. Let's look at step three. What were some either idiomatic phrases or difficult vocabulary concepts that you noticed when you read the text that stuck out to you as something like, oh, this is, this is gonna be, this is gonna be tricky. You gotta find all words about ownership and properties and ground covering. Yeah, we have a pool and the ground coverings, and I don't know how I would even begin to talk about permeability. And so, yeah, there's probably a lot of very specific words in that. What else did you guys find in your text that were difficult vocabulary domains like that, or idiomatic phrases in particular? And I, I guess it makes sense that in, if, you, if you're 18 years old, you probably haven't had to use a lot of numbers in the hundreds. You probably don't have a lot of money. You probably don't have to make, make number decisions. So yeah, why would they know? That's something that you'd have to talk about. Yeah, you, why would they know that yet? It's just like, why would I know to talk about ownership in Spanish until somebody's given me that opportunity to explore that domain? What else? What were some other vocabulary domains? or idiomatic expressions that you saw that you go, oh, that would be something we need to talk about before I turn them loose. What else? Caregivers. Protective parents. Protective And what would you, how would you approach a lesson where you say, okay, we've got this specific vocabulary. Here's some idiomatic expressions in there. Who else had the idiomatic expression about feelings? That was an awkward one. What was it? Difficult feelings. We got to talk about difficult feelings. That's a hard one because they're not sentimientos difíciles. No son difíciles. Right. They might be incómodos. They might be almost, but yeah, we've got to talk to students about, okay, well, what, what are we going, getting at with this text in the beginning? Why, what's the message that we're trying to get across? And then we have to think, well, how formal is it? You know, is this really formal or is it informal? Should we approximate with feelings? Yeah, in Spanish, I don't, I don't know if we have difficult emotions. Yeah, it doesn't quite line up that way, but they could be temas difíciles, right? They could be temas difíciles, but I don't think we'd have difficult emotions in Spanish. No, no, see, we, <laughs> that's an interesting thought. Anybody else come up with a very unusual or una frase torpe ahí? Pat down. Pat down. Oh, pat down. What did you do with it? What do you think? How would how would we help students with that? Palpar. Could be palpar. Yeah. Inspección en la ropa. Sometimes we got to move around things. Yeah. So, yeah. But you can see that we could spend. After, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's probably another pragmatic level, probably not what they're going on in the text, but we could have a conversation about formality level and closeness, yeah. Um, so what were some topics on mechanics? Um, we kind of forget to teach things like capitalization and punctuation. Quotations look differently in English and Spanish, and if we're producing a written text that somebody's gonna read, we have all these mechanics that we forget. Uh, looks slightly different in Spanish. What were some things that you noticed that you could teach off of a translation? All, all of our punctuation marks mean kind of the same thing, but are realized slightly differently in other languages, right? Yeah, those kinds of things. I, I always notice capitalization issues. I notice capitalization issues all the time, maybe like days of the week, uh, the months, 
um, even like subject names, when they do vocabulario de la universidad, those are always things that I have them mark and double check, um, especially con los gentilicios. Like, you know, in the, the one that said, like, many Texans believe that. Obviously, the first time they wrote Los Tejanos creen que, and I didn't want their Los Tejanos, but I also, and when they, then they fixed it to La Gente Tejana, but they had La Gente Tejana with big T, and I didn't want that either, you know, there were all kinds of mini lessons about that. Okay, so for the step five, I'm actually going to go back. Sometimes it's good to have a model, or just inspirarte un poco. So this, these were questions that were for a specific assignment. Now that I think about it, I think this was one that they had done um, aftercare um, information for breast cancer patients. Uh, I think that's what this one was. Uh, anyways, um, I, I usually try to give them about five specific questions. Um, and when we get to the next slide, and then we will be almost done. But when we get to the next slide, I will give you some more like guidelines. But how many of you already got to write three um, reflection questions about your translation? Kind of. Okay, take one more minute and get at least a reflection question, and then I'll have everybody share their favorite reflection question. So get, get at least one. Take one more minute if you haven't done that yet. And if you need some inspiration, here's some questions that I asked them. Merita o Amerita, both work. Sí, Amerita, Merita, Amerita, también. Sí. <laughs> so. Maybe just, yeah, volunteers, could I hear some of your um, ideas for reflection questions? And I would say not all reflection questions have to be specific, but you should always have some that are specific, right? But some can be general. What did you guys come up with? So they had to find something formal and something informal. Yes. Where, you guys had one with lots of commands in it, didn't you? Yeah. Reflection questions, examples, somebody else? I'd like to hear five or six. Give an example of, exactly. Like whenever we tell them like, oh, was this hard or was this easy? Way? Oh, they always, yeah. Or like, nah, it was fine. I mean, they don't, but giving them a specific thing to talk about helps them kind of monitor that learning. Yeah. In the commands, like asking them, how did you make that decision? Because we make decisions when we talk constantly and we don't realize that we're making decisions, right? Like I'm constantly probably deciding how formal or informal to be how much I can use my hands without looking, you know, nuts. And we, we're constantly making those decisions and we've got to teach them to reflect on those decisions that they've been making. What else did you guys come up with for a reflection question? Yeah, we, the, the, I remember when we translated some kind of a museum text, there was something about huipiles, you know, los ponchos de Guatemala. And well, it was like, well, what do we do? Are we just going to call it a weepil and, and, and just put weepil, but say it weepil in, in English? Like, does that, it, should we call it a poncho? And so what we did, yeah, we ha we ended up calling it a weepil, but in parentheses explaining. And I'm sure with, yeah, with, it, yeah. And they came up with a short phrase. I was like, don't, don't go nuts, but, you know, something short in parentheses. And they ended up add, adding because culturally, the languages didn't line up evenly where there was one specific word that worked with we be. It, it just, you know, it wasn't really a poncho, but it was kind of a poncho, but we couldn't really say poncho because, uh, you know, 
And so we sometimes have to add things and ask students how they made those decisions. Any other reflection questions that you wanted to share? Yeah, questions are, questions are hard for us to monitor where we put things. I've noticed even really advanced heritage student, heritage learners, students sometimes have difficulty in questions, knowing where they wanna put the subject and asking them, well, well, how, what did you think about when you made that decision? Kind of helps them situate themselves back in the process, especially when they get in that like, I don't know, this kind of like rhythm where they they just start like doing literal translations. It's really good to give them those reflection questions about, well, what are you trying to do? Why do you think the author said it this way? And bring them back into that thought process. Here's a weird one with, with verbs. In English, we often use the present progressive to talk about the future. You say like, oh, am I picking you up at the airport tonight? And then, but you're definitivamente no te estás recogiendo a alguien esta noche because you're not doing it right now. Es más tarde, right? Or you say things like, oh, I'm working tomorrow. Mañana estoy trabajando. You know, wait. It doesn't line up the same way in English and Spanish, and we have to make those decisions because they lightly know implicitly that estoy trabajando is I'm working, but you can say I'm working tomorrow, but you can't say estoy trabajando mañana. And yeah, <laughs> we've got to line those up again, right? They don't always mean what they mean at the superficial level. Okay. That's it. Anytime I see INGs, I always plan a mini lesson on that in the text because they love ING in many ways. And then, well, because in English, it's very common. We, we have lots of gerunds. We do a lot of things with gerunds more than infinitives and bringing them back and not everything's ando and yendo. Eh? We can't do that all the time. <laughs> so then the last question was, I think, I guess I'm struggling with moving that how they will revise their work. Let me give you some thoughts and then I'll hear from you. Um, it's always hard to come up with a plan to revise work and it, it's gonna depend on how big your class is. Uh, sometimes I have 25 students in the translation class and it's a circus <laughs> if we all work individually with me, right? And so sometimes that means that I have to shorten the translation projects and give them less so that we can really revise it and get quality work. Um, if the stakes are not high, uh, then I don't have to revise it as well. But most of the things that we do that are for a big grade, it's because the stakes are high and these are real people that are going to be basing real life decisions on the words that we write for them and we want it right. Um, and so a lot of strategies that I've done before are, well, do the mini lessons, work on the assignment, have them work in pairs. I often pair up a heritage and second language learner because they kind of tend to complement each other with different knowledges. Um, I usually have more heritage learners and second language learners in my classes though, so it's not always a perfect mix, but I often do that. Um, then I grade their reflection because they don't know what to fix until I remind them that they have to fix things. Um, I always try to separate at least a week from the first draft um, before they actually get to read my comments on their reflection assignment and start over because everything sounds great to you when you have both languages side by side. You're like, I would totally say it this way and you wouldn't, right? But I always try to distance them for at least a week before we go back and work on it again. So we work on something else in the meantime. Um, and then a lot of times I have them grade, um, so I have them work on their revisions and their grade either comes from how much they revised based on the reflection or how much they offered to somebody else to revise. Because in my classes, not everybody has the same linguistic experiences and some of my students are able to offer more corrections and some of my students can't because they don't have as many, they haven't had as much input in their life. So sometimes, so they can pick whether their revision grade comes from how much they offered um, as a suggestion to somebody else, or 
how many suggestions they incorporated from somebody else. Otherwise, it's just not fair because they all have different experiences in life. So what are some ideas that you had about how students could revise their work? They can even present on the decisions that they made about, yeah, that's nice. Talk about how they made those decisions of what to fix. Yeah, that's great, and especially reminding them to be very intentional about how they're fixing things. Yeah. Otherwise, some of them are, are great at turning on that monitor, and some of them just go with it, right? <laughs> we got to remind them to turn it on. Yeah. I think a lot of times we were taught not to incorporate translations in the language classroom because we have this idea that there's like a right answer with a translation. And there really isn't a right, a right answer because we're all going to receive texts differently. As readers, we all have different experiences and are going to want something different in that text. And we might need a different level of explanation, right? Like we might need more parentheses if I'm translating Wipil into English, whether that if I'm translating it, I don't know, into another language. Like we might have different levels of familiarity with things. What else can we do to help students revise? This one that's kind of by, and it's online, The Devil's Bridge. Um, if you wanted a narrative translation, this is one of the options. I have people work, I do like the jigsaw technique. Yeah, and I'll have a lot of people work on like one through three, and then a lot of people work on four through six, and then they combine and then they look at it together and pull out decisions and they kind of debate out which situations were best. Like if that's another strategy if you're just doing a short translation, like separated into sentences like this one here. I think this one ended up with 11 sentences and I'll usually have like some people, I'll say, okay, you guys do one through three and then you guys do four through six. And then it's like, okay, well, you all of you had one through three. So what did you say? Well, what did you say? Well, what did you say? And like, ah, but which one's better? Oh, which one has different elements that we could combine? Yeah, so I have, a, I have students a lot of times like work independently and then bring it back together and make those decisions. Yeah. I haven't done that kind of like telephone strategy, but that, yeah. But I, I do like to have students like move back and forth between languages in the classroom. I, I, this idea that like, oh, when we're in a Spanish class, can you say, like, that's not any of our lives. Have you ever, like, <laughs> yeah, right? And you know that people speak both languages. Have you ever just spoken one to them for that long? Never, right? Um, so I like that idea of going back and forth and playing with the languages. You know, I'm not going to pretend that I don't know English in a Spanish class because <laughs> I lived my life in English to its fair that I can pretend that I know that, right? Yeah, but I think that's a great strategy of having them then do the inverse and see if it lines up with the original message and intention. And it might not sometimes, which would be interesting, right? to see where those gaps are and how we divide up the world differently in different languages. Any other thoughts about that? Should, revising the translations really is a, a hard part. You really have to come up with a, with a plan before they get started and, and kind of parcel it out for them. So, okay, these would be some of my recommendations. Obviously, in a perfect world, we would have shared those online and you could have seen all of the grammar and vocabulary topics that other people thought of, but hopefully you got to share in voz alta, and hopefully you got some ideas that way. Um, I recommend if you're doing high stakes translations um, to have only two or three per semester. If you're not ready to do high stakes translations that real people will use um, in their real lives, then you can do more, right? It depends on the level. Um, but for a high stakes translation, it should not be one grade. It should be lots of grades. Like it should be, how well did you learn this grammar topic? And how well can you explain this grammar topic? And how well did you find it in this? And then how well did you reflect? And then how well did you revise or offer revisions to another student? And then how well did you turn in the final copy? There should be lots and lots of different grades on it. Um, I also like to have students work independently and then work together and then revise independently and then share it again. So we do a lot of back and forth movement. Um, 
I also teach them how to like search words in Google because I'm terrible with prepositions sometimes. It's like, is that on or is that in? Like, which one is it? And I just Google it in quotes and I teach them how to Google things in quotes and like when you don't know what, how, what's, what sounds more natural. Um, we spend a lot of lessons of just learning the symbols in word reference so that we can all be independent translators and go back to word reference and use our materials online. Um, and I teach them how to be tricky with Google searches and get better Google searches so that they can get better ideas about what sounds natural. Um, and I do work at a university that is socially just, that is social justice oriented. And so this is part of our curriculum. And this course is flagged as a social justice mission marker in our university. But even if that's not a goal for your university, I would also encourage you to think about how, so, how social justice is completely connected to translating and interpreting and how you can incorporate that as the why for students. Um, when I have offered translations on like the student parent handbook that they did so well on, right after that I gave them a narrative translation which should have been way easier and it just wasn't very good. And it wasn't very good, why do you think? motivation because I was like this is this is not very good use of the dictionary and they were like well but you know it's nobody was really gonna like base anything off of it so I just picked one of the words that I saw in word reference and went with it right and so having that social justice connection to translation about how their ability connects to the real world and can be used to improve language equity and language access for people in their community kind of establishes the why. Mm -hmm. I, I don't do the certification, but I, I met some, hey, everything's different now after the pandemic, but before the pandemic, I had someone come in and offer a presentation to students about becoming certified, um, and they can do it if they want afterwards. Um, you know, just not everybody has the same level in class. And I would say at least half of my students really could and could do it well, but there's close to half that might not be able to get certified. So yeah, I don't do the certification process, but I used to bring somebody in and have them present about how the students could get certified in different areas. They can't use my, yeah, it's just, a college class for the major, yeah. Or or if they're not necessarily a major, but they need hours in experiential learning for social justice, they take this class uh, because they, and that's also why a lot of the reflection questions are about that. Anything else? All right, thank you guys. Yep.